Good morning to you. This is William Calvin speaking from Seattle. Unfortunately, I'd much rather be in Gothenburg. I'm going to talk about the evolution of human minds and <clears throat> this uh, all too typical evolution and devolution of Homo sapiens uh, is actually rather really useful at this point. Uh, we shared a common ancestor with the chimpanzees and the bonobos uh, about seven million years ago. And after that, our ancestors were bipedal woodland apes. Say apes because brain size really hasn't changed. It's just that they've become a bit more upright and they're living in woodlands rather than in forest. Woodland is a habitat which has grasslands mixing in with trees. It's the ideal transition uh, to making a living on the savanna because there's still a tree to sleep in at night. However, by 1.8 million years ago, uh, Homo erectus had evolved and was distinctly out on the savanna. Uh, that is to say, away from familiar refuges. Our species, Homo sapiens, evolved by about 200,000 years ago. Big brain and all, they look pretty much like us, except maybe for the chin. And the puzzle is, is that it took another 150,000 years before we became the creative Homo sapiens sapiens that we are today. That is to say, many aspects of higher intellectual function look like they came in only after about three quarters of the span of Homo sapiens so far. Now to give the artist his due, I'll have to show you the depiction of the last century of progress. Now, let us talk about some of the data that does exist. And that is about brain size. It's not about intellect. Uh, but brain size you can measure from the cranial capacity. In a chimpanzee, it's about 400 milliliters. And for the first uh, four million years or so, from say six or seven million up to about three, two and a half, uh, we have brain size that's only slightly larger than chimpanzees and with no obvious uh, trend in size. There is then a group of Homo erectus skulls that do show a trend with time. That is to say, in the course of uh, a million, a million and a half years, uh, Homo erectus doubles its brain size. Then there's the period of the last three quarters of a million years where our brain size increases much more steeply. Uh, these are the homo species such as Rudolfensis and the like. Uh, and of course, here on the very right end, uh, we have Homo sapiens. Now, what else was going on at the time? As you'll note down here on the bottom, uh, I've depicted the ice ages gradually setting in by about 2.7 million years ago. And but only becoming the 100,000 year cycle in the last three quarters of a million years, roughly. Uh, we also have a record of hominid tool making, and I've depicted it like this in steps rather than a gradient, because that's what the archeologists are now telling us it was like. So I'm going to lead you into this by showing you what I think came before. There's a lot of hominid tool use, uh, just as there is in chimpanzees. Uh, but the transition into making tools according to some pattern uh, only starts at about 2.7 million years ago, at least for things that are preserved. They could have been making more elaborate uh, carvings of sticks or something of that sort earlier, and we wouldn't know about it. So, this is a cartoon, it's a nice summary. There, now I've taught you everything I know about splitting rocks. 
these are indeed, though they're not drawn very well, uh, are something of a stand-in for splitting open cobbles. That is to say, uh, good hand-sized uh, stones, typically rounded, and you can pound two of them into one another and knock off half of the stone in the process and get a fairly sharp edge around the side and also have a nice rounded portion to hold on to. Uh, that is the sort of thing that sat in about 2.7 million years ago and did not change for a million years. Uh, the way that you fall into making these, I think, uh, is you can take such a stone, particularly if you're frustrated at your attempts, and you can simply throw it against a hard rock outcrop, such as the one these cheetahs are inhabiting. Out on most of the uh, savannah, the Serengeti, uh, rocks are not uh, always at hand. But there are rocky outcrops like this. Uh, uh, every few uh, kilometers you might be able to see one. And simply throwing a stone against this gives you a split rock. Uh, it simply shatters and you search around the fragments to see if you can find a suitable sharp edge. It's a very easy way in, but it's very wasteful of rock. And taking two cobbles and purposefully pounding them together uh, is an improvement in technique and certainly in raw material conservation. So let's come back now and look at what uh, we can say about hominid tool making. Uh, there's this jump up to making them in a pattern, but it really doesn't change for over a million years. It also continues after that. Uh, it's not as if the next stage replaces it. But what you start seeing at jump number two here is you start seeing tool making to a distinct pattern. The Acheulean hand axe depicted here is usually the icon to stand in for this so-called Acheulean toolkit. As you see here, we've got some notion of symmetry. Uh, these things are flattened. You can throw them much like a frisbee. Finally, at a, in the last half million years, there is compound tool making. As say, you make one shape, and from it, you make something else. And then there's this final period of the last 50,000 years, when what you see is a burst of creativity in tool making. So what you can conclude from this is that while brain size is going up in each of these million year periods, the tool making is not. Or if it is, it's not preserved and copied by others and carried on. It's made and lost. So it's hard to conclude that brain size has been driven, as Darwin uh, thought initially, by a study improvement in tool making. At least for this first two million years of, of bigger brain hominid evolution. This conservatism in tool making also gives us another conclusion. It, brains, bigger brains are around for some reason. They may very well uh, give you a increased cleverness, but it rather looks as if this cleverness does not gradually feed back to improve the tools. That's the other conclusion out of this graph that really makes you wonder about whether our original notions of what human brain evolution, if they're really right on or far off. Now, there are some other choices for what might have been driving brain size. Uh, my own favorite is that the brain needed to be reorganized spatially and that it was simply easier to do it in a slightly bigger brain on the same principle as if you're going to 
uh, reorder all the furniture in your house, it's helpful to have a, an empty room to store things in while you're uh, doing the rearranging. As say, some storage space uh, is always useful, and in any given generation, there's a variety of brain sizes, and perhaps the ones with the bigger brains uh, found it in their during their development, it was easier to do some of the reorganization. Certainly, the temporal lobe has been reorganized over what we see, at least in monkeys, uh, to give a greater representation for language. That might have been one of the organizing principles. Uh, the second thing that we do much, much better than the great apes is sharing, and that involves a lot of keeping track of different people and whether they ever pay back uh, something that you share with them. Uh, the third thing uh, is throwing, and throwing accuracy for hunting. All these are rather demanding things on the brain. Uh, they're all uh, things that the great apes don't do very much uh, and that we do quite a lot. Furthermore, these three are all likely important for living off of large grazing animals, which once you move out of the woodlands into the savanna, you more or less have to do. Now, growth curves uh, in evolution are really few and far between. Uh, this Moore's Law kind of redoubling of the capacity, the speed or the capacity of memory chips, so forth, every several years has been going on for quite a while. That's a lovely growth curve. But you don't find very many things in evolution that are like this. I mean, it's very, all very well to invent, say, a carrying bag, which would have been a big step up in a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, but you can't keep reinventing it for extra credit. There are a few things that do, no matter how much you've got, more is better. Uh, for example, words. If you have 100 words, 200 is, is always an improvement. Uh, if you're sharing with two people, sharing with four people is usually an improvement, and so on to 8 and 16 and so forth. Furthermore, accurate throwing. Uh, however, accurate you are, however far a distance you can stay from your target, uh, more is always better. You can eat meat more days of the month. So let's go back to the woodland here, and you can see that there have been some large grazing animals here, both by the bones and by the fine cropping of this grass. Uh, but there's our ditch traded trees and brush here. Uh, but this Woodland also attracts other animals. For example, the traditional predators of the large grazing animals. They like the shade, they like the animals that come in warily, of course, to visit. However, by about 1.8 billion years, according to some of the stable carbon isotope evidence, uh, Homo erectus was eating a lot of grass. And presumably it wasn't via baking bread. It was probably indirectly via eating meat of grazing animals. Uh, this shows you a typical Serengeti scene of grazing herds of zebra and what wildebeest at a savanna waterhole. And in the background, you see the only tree. Uh, there is a lot of meat on the hoof, but there aren't very many trees for refuge. And if you're going to live out in this area and make a living, uh, you've got to have the social adaptability to uh, mount a guard at night. Uh, there are various implications of this for uh, the accomplishment of our Homo erectus ancestors. Uh, planning behaviors. Um, For, certainly for uh, planning a throw, uh, it's very important uh, in a hunting situation to do it right. As I say, missing the animal the first time is really worse than not throwing at all because dinner runs away. And secondly, when you try tomorrow, they're going to keep their distance. 
So these two things mean that uh, there's a big premium once you start in this lifestyle using throwing as a means of laying your hands on large grazing animals. There's a big premium upon getting better and better. Now, for most uh, novel actions, detail plans really are not needed. Uh, for example, <clears throat> mostly fumble and find suffices. As they just take it slow and you don't have to make a big elaborate plan at the beginning, you can just find your way into uh, a good plan. You can keep trying over and over until you succeed, although that doesn't work for, as they say, the animals tend to run away from you and dinner vanishes. Uh, for example, if you blindly pick up a cup of coffee and it turns out to be empty, you can usually sense this before the coffee cup hits your nose. This works because the movement itself is slow enough so that there's a feedback loop from your arm sensing the weight of it back into your spinal cord and then commands coming back out to the motor to the muscles uh, changing uh, their tension and therefore the trajectory of the coffee cup. Now this takes time. It takes about one eighth of a second for the forearm movement. And if you're going to do a movement that takes only one eighth of a second, that means there's no time for feedback to correct the movement. The movement is truly ballistic. Now this is the point at which you need a detailed plan. Uh, that is to say, throwing a dart only takes one eighth of a second feedback loop is too slow to fix things if you sort of catch your uh, cuff on your arm, uh, the sweat of your arm, for example, and it impedes your movement, it's just too late to fix it. So all of the ballistic movements, throwing, hammering, clubbing, kicking, spitting, are all ones that we call them ballistic because the, once you start doing them, uh, everything is on automatic thereafter. For accurate throwing, uh, you really have a substantial time, you have a window of opportunity and it narrows dramatically. Uh, so for accurate throwing, uh, if you happen to release too early, it will uh, go too far. If you release too late, it's likely to fall short. So this is what I'm calling sort of the launch window or window of opportunity. And uh, if you double the distance to the target, same size target, uh, it now is about eight times as difficult. That's say the launch window shrinks by a factor of eight. A factor of four is due to the solid angle uh, shrinking. And a factor of two in addition is because to throw twice as far you typically have to throw twice as fast. So for something like this, you have to plan every little detail of the muscle activation sequence in advance as you get set to throw. Now, for set pieces like free throws, fine, you, you get in practice, you practice this over and over, and you sort of get in the groove, and you do it exactly the same each time. That's what you sh should do with a dart throw the basketball free throw. But these are set pieces. That is to say, the physical setting never changes. And you could hunt like that in an ambush situation where you wait for the animal to you know, walk through the, the target zone and then you could launch at them. Uh, frogs who throw their tongues at flies are basically doing this. But for hunting, most target distances are novel. So the neural circuitry for planning that one-eighth of a second action sequence in excruciatingly fine detail was likely improved over several million years. And you're really forced to get better. Even within a single generation, you're forced to get better. Uh, herds will move away from you if you get too close. This, this approach distance depends on their experience with being spooked by predation or attempts. Uh, many animals, certainly as Homo erectus moved into Asia <coughs> and encountered herds that had never seen bipedal uh, 
animals before, and since all of their instincts were to avoid four-footed animals, uh, very likely the hunters could have walked up close enough to club them over the head. However, this doesn't last very long. Thus, the hunter is forced to get better at sort of the Red Queen principle from Alice in Wonderland. Or you have to look elsewhere for a naive herd that permits getting close, and you keep running out of this. So with this setting now, let us come back to tool making and its complexity. As I said, there's this early stage uh, where it's basically split cobbles. There's the second million year period of bilaterally symmetric uh, notions of shape uh, with a lot of edging applied. There's this third stage of stage tool making, and that's what I'm going to address now. Uh, this is what this is a piece of obsidian that's been broken in half, and this is the technique for shaving off these single-edged razor blades. Uh, basically, it doesn't have to be totally flat. The idea is to get a a right angle edge like this that you can, in fact, put the pusher stick on top of and shave off a blade. Blades start occurring in Africa about 280,000 years ago. This is compound tool making at a dust. Now, this last fourth stage at 50,000 years ago uh, differs from this in many, many ways. Uh, let me show you a little bit about the setting for it because the climate during this period was flipping back and forth very frequently. This shows you the last ice age only. And it's in this period between 60 and 50,000 years ago, somewhere in here, uh, that we're, de we're definitely becoming behaviorally modern, even though having been anatomically modern since 200,000 years ago. This is also the period of the second out of Africa, this time of Homo sapiens, behaviorally modern Homo sapiens, uh, spreads out of Africa once again, spreads promptly to Australia, uh, into Asia, and then eventually around the world. At the right here, you see our modern warm period of the Ice Ages, and this is the period that agriculture developed in. So what we have here is a flip between a warm and wet climate, like today's, and the cool, dry, windy, dusty climate of the Ice Ages. And the flips can occur very rapidly. This means five or ten years some of these upstrokes. The downstrokes may come down gradually and then plunge. Uh, it's these very abrupt periods that produce unusual opportunities and challenges to all the terrestrial animals that experience them, including us, certainly the animals that we were preying upon. Uh, Climate flips like this probably only speed up evolution due to other drivers. Uh, the, the real virtue here is that instead of just sort of steady pressure, it's much more like pumping. So here are some of the things that the archaeologists would list as being in the transition between anatomically modern humans and behaviorally modern. Again, anatomically modern comes in here at about 200,000 years. And you then start seeing a few things like mortuary practices of shellfish being exploited, some hints of long distance trading that developed much better later. Uh, they're starting to do some fishing for the first time, um, at least the kind of fishing that uh, leaves traces. Uh, bone tools, barbs, mining. Now we start getting into this interesting area of certainly images. Once you start seeing uh, images painted on cave walls, uh, you're definitely into behaviorally modern. 
Uh, this is an area that's argued about a bit more. For example, beads for necklaces are some of the earliest. Uh, this evidence goes back to almost 90,000 years now in North Africa and in the very south of Africa. Furthermore, there's this thing called incised patterns that I'll show you an example of. Here we go. This is a piece of red ochre, sort of blocked out. And on one of the surfaces, a whole series of striations have been cut. Uh, the black and white photograph shows you an inked in example of where all the grooves are. And it's no understandable pattern. Whatever it is, there's nothing like it earlier. So what we have is no trace for real intellect, uh, any real creativity, uh, until we get down towards 50,000 years ago. Anatomically modern, but somehow this mind's big bang or creative explosion takes a much longer time. From this, you can say, Big brains may be necessary, we don't know, for creativity, but they are not sufficient to get the modern behaviors, simply because of this 150,000 year. There's likely something else going on here as well. Uh, here's one of the things that really impresses the archaeologists, again, because you don't see it earlier. Uh, bone must have been the most common raw material at any a Homo erectus campsite because they were butchering animals all the time. Yet they didn't make tools out of that bone until the last 90,000 years, roughly. These are examples from about 25,000 years ago in France. Uh, you can see all manner of barbs, uh, holes that have been drilled and such. You even see very fine tools. This, for example, is a sewing needle. In fact, it's embedded in some Paleolithic cloth from about 26,000 years ago. Uh, these are very fine uh, tools created with little points like this. And what these were used for, it appears, is uh, they could have been used for creating this, this hole here as a drill, though uh, flaking technique is, is an alternative way of doing it. But nonetheless, you need a very sharp point to do that. Uh, but it's pretty clear that one of the uses they were making for these fine little points is to decorate. They started decorating uh, their fishing uh, spears. Uh, they would start decorating non-useful things. Portable art, art you can carry around with you, is thought to be the earliest of the art. And here you can see, uh, I mean, there's where the Bama's eye is right there. Uh, you, can, you can see this kind of art uh, going back uh, a bit further than you can the cave art on the walls. Here's another example of portable art. And this now is made out of limestone, much harder problem. All right, here's wall art. Uh, 37, 35,000 years ago at the Chauvet Caves in France, the circle on the right uh, is where these come from. Uh, this is almost as early as Homo sapiens was actually inhabiting the area. And it, it seems certainly to me as if it's likely that this is an art technique brought with them, uh, either brought out of Asia uh, because coming in through Poland was one of the routes into Europe, or coming around the eastern end of the Mediterranean and up uh, uh, through the, um, the Balkans. And the next slide. You also start to see storytelling. I mean, for example, this is an abduction scene with brothers coming to the rescue, etc. Uh, there's some tally marks up at the top. Uh, we don't know what these are from. This 
take this is a replica of of art seen on the wall of the cave in the Tanzania. So to summarize some of this, uh, it's been about 50 years since anthropologists started emphasizing the delay from anatomically modern Homo sapiens until you start getting into this period of behaviorally modern Homo sapiens sapiens, if you like. Uh, the intellectual delay was initially thought to be about 15,000 years, but as the dating has gotten better, it's now clear that that lasted 150,000 years. So what caused this big step up? Uh, why did it take so long? I'm going to go through some candidates for you, and perhaps my favorite candidate would be mimicry. That's to say the ability to look at somebody doing something and then do it yourself without a lot of uh, trial and error. Uh, mimicry is certainly seen in animals much simpler. Uh, birds, for example. Bird-sized brain is sufficient for mimicry. Uh, orangutans do a fair amount of mimicry, though on a slow time scale they may watch for several hours and then when you're not looking they may try lighting the stove themselves and, <laughs> and cooking something. Uh, but Nonetheless, in our closest relatives, the gorillas, the chimps, the bonobos, uh, there's very little mimicry being seen. Uh, Franz de Waal noted a, a limp that an adult male had from an injury was copied by some young uh, uh, chimps. And he, they even persisted doing it for a month or so after the, uh, the adult male stopped doing it. Uh, Tomosello had an experiment with young chimps failing to mimic. That is to say, he trained a couple of young chimps off in the lab to make a gesture such as touching their head in order to receive a food reward. It then put the uh, young chimps back in their play group of a dozen or so young chimps, and the experimenters would come around to the vents with their holster full of goodies and the two trained chimps would make the gesture and get rewarded, and the other chimps would not, did never, never caught on to this. They didn't observe, they didn't copy. You can see some copying if you train a high-ranking female chimp on using a probe to dislodge a food reward from a, a uh, box then other chimps will copy the technique. So to some extent it requires prestige in order to get copied. Uh, in humans, however, we mimic so easily and so unconsciously that it's, it's really impressive. Uh, that is to say there's this literature on things called mirroring, echoing, matching. And what this means is that if you're saying and talking to someone, uh, you will tend to synchronize your breathing with them. You will tend to mimic their postures and their method of speech. And you'll do this even with strangers, not just with friends. Uh, waitresses can use this technique to establish rapport with their customers, and indeed they can get uh, bigger tips this way. So the, I'm going to list here the candidates that have been proposed for this transition into Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, mimicry uh, is my uh, favorite. Uh, creativity in general is often proposed. Uh, perhaps the, the most frequent proposal is that it represents a transition into using uh, symbolic uh, stuff, language more specifically. Uh, it's been proposed that it's really uh, much an improvement in the rational abilities. In other words, more logic. A uh, recent proposal is more working memory. Uh, another one is planning abilities. And finally, of course, there is our kind of consciousness. Uh, that there is some big step up, some blossoming that this took place. I tend to treat consciousness as something of an umbrella term for all the others. Uh, that, but um, 
I would actually agree with, with all of these candidates. I think they're all on the right track. I would just add the word structured to all of them. For example, not just simple mimicry, but mimicry of a sequence of events. Uh, the kind of creativity that allows you to get set offline before acting and then carry it out without uh, any false moves. Not just symbols, uh, but long sentences needing syntax. Uh, chains of logic, the kind of working memory uh, that is structured that would enable you to do contingent plans, for example. And finally, the kind of consciousness that I have in mind is really goes beyond awareness to imagination and an imagination that produces high quality results. With syntax, syntax is what allows you to go beyond the two word sentence and produce sentences of almost any length. Uh, furthermore, you can nest sentences inside of one another. You can say, I think I saw him leave to go home, which has four verbs you might notice. The, the higher intellectual functions in general are indeed the structured things. Nested syntax, contingent plans, games that have arbitrary rules, which of course is very much like logic. Uh, in, in logic, your arbitrary rules are quality judgments that you have to reach a threshold uh, of good fit before it becomes logic. Music that goes beyond rhythm and melody to use multiple voices, uh, as in the art of the fugue, for example, or even part singing. Coherence finding, as when we discover hidden patterns amidst seeming chaos. I mean, will work hard on a jigsaw puzzle and crossword puzzles for exactly a series of such eureka moments. Complex thought, as in figurative speech, narrative frameworks, parables that map one story onto another story. Indeed, these are all examples of structured thought. They all separate humans from the great apes. Uh, just try to imagine us without this to see what life might have been like more than 100,000 years ago. Let me back up here. But without structuring plus offline quality improvements, you can't create novel sentences of any length or complexity. And you likely cannot think such thoughts either. Now let me go through some of the things that require uh, keeping track of a lot of relationships as in, in our hunt for things that might have been the antecedents of our kind of structured thought. Interestingly enough, sharing is one of them. Now, the great apes have some sharing. It's mostly what you'd call tolerated scrounging. For example, in gorillas, you see here the, the general principle that they hang on to their branch and allow a favored relative or friend uh, to also nibble at some leaves. But they're not going to share this out like a cocktail hostess and offer people food. Uh, indeed, tolerated scrounging often isn't tolerated. Here's a six-year-old grandson trying to get a grandfather to share, and it doesn't work. Now, while stat sharing is pretty much standard in us, uh, apes are reluctant. And so, again, we have something with a long growth curve, just like throwing accuracy in range or like vocabulary acquisition. More is always better. Sharing, however, has the cheater problem at every step up. We have to have some method to combat the freeloaders or the, the free riders. And that requires keeping track of people and their relationships. Uh, we need, in effect, to keep rough track of who owes what to whom. By tagging the memory with whether the person is a actor, a recipient, uh, by tagging objects, whether they're suitable, 
uh, are valuable. And once this metal capacity evolves, because of the natural selection going on for uh, sharing in an environment where there's a lot of meat to be shared, uh, once that metal capacity evolves, we can likely use exactly such case marking circuits to gossip about who did what to whom. So the basic theory here, due to Derek Beckerton, is who owes what to whom makes a transition into who did what to whom. So the outbreak of, of structured stuff like this probably goes something like this. Uh, you've got some adults or older children that slowly manage to consistently speak long sentences. And that there are some conventions used to identify whether a noun is an actor or an acted upon. Uh, in English, we don't have uh, very much of this, but of course, many other languages do, and in English, our, our personal pronouns uh, still retain them. Uh, an actor is he, if the same person acted upon, is called him. Now, small children are going to hear the structured stuff, and they figure out the syntax and are even better as adults because earlier soft wiring of the brain works better. Uh, so this transition from words and short sentences into being able to do who did what to whom now sets you up to do long sentences, more complex thoughts, contingent plans, games and logic, music beyond melody, coherence, fine creativity. Now is earlier soft wiring better but genetic changes that during development can tweak things. This is sort of the inheritable uh, aspect. And in general, what you see uh, in gene culture interaction is that behavioral innovation leads and then gene changes in the aftermath may improve the payoff for later generations. So language and intellect gets augmented even more over and over but the initial drivers in this case are things like uh, sharing, uh, vocabulary, and throwing accuracy. They all have long growth curves. They're all extremely handy for regularly eating large grazing animals. We need structuring for all the higher intellectual functions. But I think that the regular exercise in it may be something as mundane as gossip. The problem comes now in we need creativity for novel situations, and so we need some way, as we get set, to bootstrap up the quality, to improve it, so it's not what it initially might be, is just a juxtaposition of some things that are floating around in your head and no more connected than your nighttime dreams, uh, to shape that up into something that really hangs together well and can be acted upon. That's the kind of transition that I expect to see going on at 50,000 years ago. That it's the transition from short sentence language to this long sentence, much more creative, high quality language. And the transition is by the explosive nature of it really is because young children get exposed to structured language, whether it's sign or spoken, in their early formulative years, and they now softwire their brain around it to be very much more efficient adults. Now, I'd like to close by saying a little bit about planning. Uh, it certainly seems to have played in terms of planning for throwing, uh, planning for sharing, uh, planning for long distance trade. It, it's played a considerable role in the past in making us what we are. Uh, but the kind of foresight uh, has perhaps not come under the same kind of selection pressure. Uh, Edmund Burke, uh, the Irish-English uh, statesman of several centuries ago, uh, said, the public interest requires doing today those things that men of intelligence and goodwill would wish five or ten years hence had been done. 
And there are certainly indications that what abilities we have in this regard are rather limited. Uh, for example, our rationality is clearly limited by what's called status quo bias in, in behavioral economics. There's a tendency to keep doing what you've always done, and that's often stronger than the rational arguments for changing course. Uh, people have a tendency, when faced with too many choices, to decide not to decide. And this, in our political discourse, is often known as blowing smoke. That is to say, saying lots of things to confuse people, to put off a decision, to be able to continue a profitable uh, scheme for much longer. Uh, there are many of us that suspect this has been going on in climate. Uh, the global warming story for the last uh, 20 or 30 years, I think, has been influenced strongly by this. Uh, furthermore, people endow their possessions, their paychecks, with inordinately high value simply because they possess them. I mean, people feel the pain of a loss more acutely than the joy of a gain. One reason why future gains are hard to balance with the loss of present-day spending money. And again, in climate change, this is a big problem because we've, to invest for the future, uh, certainly without a surefire payoff, uh, is, is hard to sell given that so many people revert to this pre-rational uh, decision. In particular for climate, as I have a, a new book coming out called Global Fever. Uh, this is one of the uh, illustrations from it. But this is the rate of carbon emissions into the atmosphere, the amount of new CO2 being added each year. And it's been growing, as you see in the left part of the graph. And from the present year onwards, if we don't change how we do business, it will grow uh, as in the upper right, called business as usual. Uh, we have to turn this around. If we turn it around before 2020, uh, we could probably avoid the three degree fever, the sort of thing that really causes uh, climate, climate refugees and genocides. Uh, if we manage to turn this around so that we get into this territory of not sinking, that is say we take more CO2 out of the air than we put in, then we can begin to remove the accumulated carbon. Uh, and that's the point that we have to achieve before we're going to start reversing anything uh, about climate. We have to start getting into this removal territory. We have to do that fast enough. Uh, there are three technologies in combination, I'll just mention very quickly, uh, that uh, look like they could solve this 2020 part of the problem. That is to say, if you get rid of a lot of the gasoline and petrol use uh, with plug-in hybrid vehicles, uh, you could start retiring some super tankers. Uh, if you start building enough nuclear or geothermal power plants, you could retire many coal trains. And of course, wind and solar, if you can ramp them up fast enough, could do part of this job. But this requires many gigawatts of capacity, and most wind and solar is still being measured in megawatts. Finally, you have to do something to get elect electricity to comp countries that are apt to generate it using their own coal or oil. As to say, you have to try to head off what the developing countries are doing by, for example, uh, taking electricity generated by nuclear plants in perhaps Spain, and piping it all across North Africa with, with DC power transmission lines uh, that don't lose so much power by heating. You have to do things like this worldwide, and emission gross growth can stop by 2020, and you might be able to turn it around into net sinking by 2040. That seems an exercise to show you the now crucial importance that higher intellectual function is now coming under natural selection in a big way. That is to say, we either solve this problem or we lose a great deal of our civilization. We lose half or more of all species. 
Uh, this is a do it and do it quickly situation, the likes of which we've never had to deal with before. Thank you.